My thing is, you're going to know I'm here. You know, if there's nobody in the front, I'm going to be in the front so that when a person is speaking, they see me, they see me engaging, interacting. I don't want to be the person that's in the back, right? That's just kind of in the crowd. So I always like to tell people to come up front. I'm not going to take up too much of your time. I just want to tell you to have fun, pay attention, and engage. Um, this day is really all about you. So um, I'm going to stop for that. You're going to be seeing me throughout the day. So I'm, I'm going to stop there. So, like I said, I'm Marshall. Um, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and how you can get started in the field um, if you're a that has an entry. So a little bit more about my background. Um, I already covered the basics. I also am the founder of Bytes, which is a meetup, um, where I just cover bite-sized lessons. I cover bite-sized lessons on um, different topics within technology. Um, so those are, I haven't done them monthly or weekly. They're kind of just like on like a, um, like as, like, you know, as it comes basis, but I do want to get them more regularly. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. Um, so in my free time, I do yoga. I'm a dog mom. Um, so I keep moving rookie. I like reading, writing, exploring, and quality time with family and friends. So I'm going to cover the, the intersections between artificial intelligence and virtual reality. So what is artificial intelligence? It's an umbrella term. Um, so there's a bunch of different terms underneath it. There's machine learning, deep learning, um, pure vision, natural language processing, and neural networks. So I want to talk a little bit about the definitions behind them. So machine learning is the ability of a computer system to mimic human capabilities. Um, you kind of improve the performance based on what you program it to do. So um, for instance, like if you're teaching a computer how to, or a program how to walk, you have to teach it how to do like the basic function of first um, observing how walking, how walking, um, like, yeah, like pretty much how, like how it occurs, um, the movements, the different joints. Uh, then there's deep learning. There's uh, computer vision, which is like object detection and um, the ability of a program to recognize an object that you've placed in front of it. Um, there's natural language processing, which is pretty much what Siri uses. Um, and then there's also neural networks, which is a program doing what your brain does, um, or thinking the way you think. So when you describe a table, you know the basic uh, like classification of what a table is. So you know it has a flat surface, objects can sit on top of it. Um, it might have four legs, it might be rectangular, and chairs might be around it. So now we're gonna just do a quick little activity. Um, and this is helpful just because even though it's for kids, it's helpful to understand how it how it operates or how an artificial intelligence program might function. So I'm sorry, you want to put me in the Does this one work? So for this I'll classify um, I'll do emotions. And I'll recognize it as a text. The license was for kids. Dot co. Dot uk. So within this, I'm creating buckets, and buckets are basically just um, like little databases where you can put the information that the program needs to process, what, it, what you want it to classify. So if you wanted to classify emotions, you'll put um, maybe sad, and you'll put the de de um, definers of what sad means. So I'll just do sad. And then I'll add an example. So I'll say tears. I'll say frowning. Um, I'll say bye. That. Um, okay, so these are just like um, input classifiers that the program would need to understand what you're trying to, what you, what you want it to understand, or what you want it to um, get from what you're inputting. So then you'll do learn and test.
Okay, for some reason the entire page is showing, but basically what this will do is if you put in, um, I keep crying, I don't know what's wrong with me, the computer would say you're sad. So it would detect that you input a classifier that it recognizes and go from there. So, I wanted to show you guys another quick video. Um, I'll kind of just tell you what's happening in the video. There's an old movie, probably before you guys were born, it's called AI Artificial Intelligence. And in this scene, the little boy, he's mimicking what he thinks, I love this movie too. <laughs> he's mimicking what he, um, his new parents are doing. So he's a robot, he's an artificially intelligent robot. And he's watching them eat, and he can't eat, obviously. So he's kind of just like observing. And he's like kind of taking it in. And then he starts to mimic what he sees them doing. I know. <laughs> so yeah, so he's just trying, he's taking the, the information that um, he's receiving from them and mimicking their actions. <laughs> so it's cute, you guys should watch it. Um, and next, I just want to show you guys an image recognition application. It's fine. Sure. So there's this new movie called Aelita or Aelita. Um, you guys watch it? And like, there's a scene where she's eating an orange, but she's a robot, but she can taste what an orange tastes like. So that was just like mad creepy to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so next, I just want to show you guys a quick video. So next, I wanted to quickly cover virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. So um, these, you know, virtual reality is just um, like, you know, you put a headset on and you can see what mimics real life. Um, so virtual world. There's augmented reality, which is pretty much Pokemon Go, and then there's mixed reality, which is a combination of both. And um, this is just like a full video on, okay. probably can't show you guys, but it was a cool video on like a hyper-realistic scenario of mixed reality, um, where like a person's kind of just walking and they see, um, they see like different things in their screen, they see the real world, they see people, they're going grocery shopping, they see pop-ups, pretty cool. Um, and so the impact of AI and VR on the future, it'll impact every industry as you know. Um, healthcare, automotive, you know, there's already autonomous vehicles, smart glasses, smart homes, um, there'll be a lot of hacking, so cybersecurity will be really important. And then law and policy making as well. And how you can get started, you can join online communities, um, attend meetups, you know, there's a bunch of resources online for free, there's YouTube, and then you can also seek resources from your school, I'm sure they have plenty of resources for you guys. And my meetup is called by Tiffania. I've done Intro to Python, Intro to Artificial Intelligence. I'm going to start online meeting, meetings soon and meetups. Um, and then I offer, also offer free one on one mentorship and tutoring. And that's all. Any questions? I know I had to kind of rush through this. Let's <laughs> <laughs> okay. give it up for Mia. Um, my name is Michael Brown. I'm the general partner at Settlement Capital's $5 million early stage venture capital fund that invests in neuroscientists of color and other people who are of color who do anything in neuroscience. I'm a data scientist, my background is focused on neuroscience. Um, but you guys have been doing a lot of like tech stuff all day, so I thought I'd line it up a little bit with uh, like Alexander Hamilton. Yeah. So, um, who knows that? Does everyone, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Not the founding father of the play, right? Yeah. They're, they're saying that two different things. Right? Um, so why don't we keep going, all right? <laughs> How does an orphan, son of a whore and a Scotsman, grown up in the part of the forgotten clique in the Caribbean, impoverished and swallow, grow up to be a hero and scholar, the ten dollar, found your father without a father, got a lot farther by working a lot harder, by being a self starter by 14. They put him in charge of a trading chart. 
today, my slaves are being carted and carried away. Brought to the way to the for a bar. Word got around, they said, this kid is insane, man. Took up a collection just to send him to the mainland. Go get your education. Don't forget from whence you came. The world's gonna know your name. What's your name? Mo. What's your name? Mo. <laughs> Alexander Hamilton. Come on, say it out loud. Here you go. Alexander Hamilton. And there's a million things he has. Just do it. When he was 10, his father slipped. Full of it. Debt ridden. Two years later, you see Alex and his mother half ridden, half dead. Sitting in their own scent, the scent thick, and Alex got better, but his mother went quick. Ooh. Moved in with the cousin, the cousin committed suicide. Oh, Looked back, something new inside, saying, Alex, you've got fed for yourself. Started retreating and reading every treatise on the shelf. There would have been nothing left to do for someone else's suit. He would have been dead or destitute without a cent of restitution. He started working, working for his late mother's landlord. Trading sugarcane and all the things you know we can't afford. Scamming for every book that he can get his hands on. See him in the bow of the ship as he stands on. The bow of the ship headed for a new land where people of color can be at Microsoft and. Zuckerberg, even Spiegel, and all these guys who like happen to be white people and can do whatever they want and also start tech companies. I really do believe that under what was supposed to be the 14th Amendment, right, yeah. and definitely the first, we should be able to do the same thing. So, like, it should be accepted that you can be both of those things. It should be accepted that you can be whatever you want. And that paradigm should impact your ability to raise money. It shouldn't impact your ability to have a start. It shouldn't impact any of those things. And the reason that I think that's important is because like, particularly the time that we're living in now, people seem to forget that, right? You know what I'm saying? So yeah, so that's that's the opener. Um, I, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and then I'll kind of talk about you know, some of the stuff I've done. I think the main thing that kind of I wanted to do today was impart one message to all of you via that kind of monologue and also what I'm gonna say, which is that you can be entrepreneurs, right? And I think being an entrepreneur is a really, 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 really important thing in this day and age because it's the most scalable it's ever been and a path to wealth creation, which particularly for people of color from a general wage wealth perspective, we've been left out, right? Apart from the brownstone babies, and there's a few of them, we've been left out. And this is the first time in, in the history of probably the country where that kind of generational wealth is accessible and scalable, right? You know, you start an app, you raise money for it, you sell it for a couple million dollars, right? Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about me. So, I grew up in South London, uh, a place called Catford. Catford's okay, you know, it's kind of like the South Bronx, it's got problems, it's got good things, mostly a community of colour. Um, and I, I graduated uh, school at a young age, and I went to university, and I graduated university at 19. And uh, if you look online on my LinkedIn or whatever, you can see there's a picture of me like shaking Prince Charles' hand. That was uh, something that was called the Royal Honours Program. It's well, something I was part of as a computer scientist and able to graduate in 19. I then worked um, on the trading floor at Barclays in uh, something called the Property Risk Control Unit, which is basically where I create financial products around property, uh, multi billion dollar products. And then I went on from there to work at Aon. Um, Aon is the second biggest insurer in the world behind Marsh. And actually, there's a really interesting story uh, behind that. I originally started Aon as a data club, uh, even though I had a computer science degree. And basically what happened was on my first week or so, I wrote some super simple VBA code that automated my entire department. <laughs> so they promoted me from that to being a software engineer. And then I was there for five or six years. And then by the time I left, I was a senior product manager. I then went from there to work at Viacom, um, where I ran kind of content distribution for brands like TV and Nickelodeon, and worked with some of the stars you see on kind of Viacom's roster. And then I did that same thing for a short point at NBC as well. 
And then in all of this, something very particular happened to me, especially when I was at NBC. Um, I, uh, I was part of this entrepreneurial group called Breakout. So the best way to think about Breakout is like being one degree separated from some of the people you saw in that video. So like there are people in Breakout who are one degree separated from Mark Zuckerberg, one degree separated from Spiegel, one degree separated from VCs and funds and a lot of different things all over the place. And we went to Baltimore and uh, I got to meet this, this young uh, man who uh, was at this place called Harbour. And basically his name was Amari. He uh, was commuting from one side of Baltimore he was an orphan coming from one side of Baltimore to Harbour, the other was like 4.0 GPA and um, you know he was living in a very dangerous environment but doing really really well and you know the events around that you can read about them online about me um, inspired me to uh, to want to fight on behalf of people of colour and I realised in my jobs that I was doing before I wasn't really doing that right like I was I was benefiting myself I wasn't really doing that and there's an inherent amount of privilege that came with that that I recognised and that I needed to fix and so I created something called Film Funder. Um, so a film funder is AI that basically predicts what a film will do, right? And it recently got acquired for a couple million dollars. Um, and so in, the, in that part of things though, you know, I'm skipping a lot around like what it really means to be a black entrepreneur in this country. Uh, when you guys get a chance, uh, check out something called The Hammer's Journey. And basically what this is, is it's at the beginning of conceptualizing an idea, at the beginning of coming up with something that you want to do, you're excited about it. And there's mentors and there's advisors and everyone's ever it's great. And then, you get to the point where you have to do it. Not the press, not telling your friends about it. You've got to go raise money, you've got to build it out, whatever you're doing. And then there's this thing called the abyss, right? <laughs> and, and for black entrepreneurs in, in, in America, it's an unavoidable paradigm, no matter your socioeconomic status, simply because the lack of generational wealth that has historically existed means there aren't like parents to support all of us if we decide to actually go and build that, right? And even for those of us that do have that, there's a limited runway for that. There's a limited understanding, there's a limited desire. And so all of a sudden, as a black entrepreneur to reach the level that I'm at now and, and that some of my friends are at, you really do have to inevitably, despite your socioeconomic status and how smart you are, go through a period where you economically suffer, right? And, and that, that shouldn't be that way because, you know, entrepreneurs of other definitions, they don't go through that, right? So that's why they can be who they are. You know, you can fail multiple times, raise five, ten million dollars, and never get your apple off the ground if you, if you don't like us, right? Um, so, you know, that, for that reason, uh, after I saw Film Funder, I sat and I, like, this is actually last year, but this is very recent. I sat and I thought, all right, what, if, what else can I do to help, right? And actually, that year, one of the things I did is I, uh, I, I went up to City University. Has anyone been to City University here? You know what City University is? Yeah, cool. Yeah, City Uptown Harlem. And, um, I, it's funny, the day I went up there to speak, like I am to you guys, to a group of um, uh, computer science students, uh, I'd just got an investment, right? I was sleeping on my parents' couch at the time in the land, and I'd just got an investment the day before, and I went up to do this, this speech, and the president of the school was there to see me. Like, this was like a speech of like 20, 30 kids in a classroom with me, and I was like, why is the president here to see me? And he proceeded to tell me that of the entire class, right? Of the entire school, of that entire year, of that, the whole computer science division, only 2% of the students were getting computer science jobs. And they all have 4.0 GPAs, right? This is the thing. That's like if everyone in here studied to get a 4.0 GPA and just the front row got jobs in computer science and the rest of you all were doing cleaning jobs, right? And like, for, for where I come from, and again, it's stuff you can read about, I won't like harp on it too much because I want to try to be value generating in this conversation, but for where I come from, seeing that, it made me like personally angry. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't think you read it. Do you know what I'm like, personally angry? Like, and I was like, okay, I need to fix this, right? And again, I just confunded, like things were difficult, but what I proceeded to do with David and the president of the school is every night we did um, resume mentoring sessions with every student. And I, and I sent specific emails to friends of mine at Facebook, Google, Amazon, and we placed 300 people in jobs over the course of like six months. Wow, that's awesome. So like, I think people would actually give credit. So David Weiss, okay, it wasn't just me sitting there like, and friends of mine, oh, let's get you a job, let's get you a job. Because there were other people helping me. Like, <laughs> who give credit to um, so, so that happened and, and, and all this stuff happened and I was like, all right, so something really weird is happening, right? Like, I come to places and I'm changing things, right? 
And yes, it's kind of because of my background, I go, I took a bit about my neuroscience background for a second. And yes, it's because I sound the way I do. And yes, it's because I can rap well, great. But like, all of that stuff shouldn't be the story of one. There's this fallacy um, for the exceptional Negro fallacy here in, in, in America, right? Also known as crack the barrel, right? Like, if you're in a community of black people or people of color, apparently only one or two people are special enough to be taken out of that community and given honor as human beings under the 14th Amendment, the thing that runs the country, you know? Alexander Hamilton guy did that. So, you know, like, so I, I didn't want to propagate that. And so like, at the end of last year when I saw Film Funder, I was like, all right, how do I like change this on a societal level? And that's what Sentinel Capital, my fund, is about, right? I'm looking for black neuroscientists to invest in because neuroscience is one of the least understood fields by investors right now, but it's also one of the highest. So if you think about like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was out there. If any of you started a social media company tomorrow, you'd have to raise hundreds of millions of dollars to compete with Mark. And he's a tetchy guy. I mean, I don't know if you'd be raving about him, but he don't really mess around. So, so I was like, all right, what generational wealth-wise in tech can black people do to be able to create that kind of wealth that isn't clogged up by everyone else? And that happens in neuroscience, right? So that's also my background. Um, at the end of uh, kind of my career in the nine to five world at NBC in 2016, I had some interest in neuroscience already. I'd done bioinformatics at undergrad, uh, one of my computer science degree. And uh, I was like, all right, let me do this thing. And so I, I, go I went through the initial stages of enrolling a uh, PhD level um, at a place called Fielding University, which is uh, connected to UC Berkeley. And um, you can look this up online as well. I created something called Neurocenter. And this is the idea that you can put a headset on somebody and scan their brain and combine that with sentiment analysis to predict what they're going to think. Wow. Yeah, electroencephalography. We got a small black girl, my team is on it! Let's give it up! Yeah. Yeah. understanding of uh, your brain uh, and then fMRI which cross-references that to be able to predict what called voxels and they're three-dimensional parts of your brain to understand what's on the things and if you want to look up my work around that just google my name or probably sentiment c-e-n-t-i-m-e-n-t -E -E which is a lot easier or well, just follow me on Instagram my um, <laughs> so, um, so I did that and then as I did this something amazing started to happen right I had tried to kind of raise money around Film Funder. I tried to be an entrepreneur in, in other areas, but people just really started to take me seriously for this thing, right? And so, you know, Spring invested in my company, IBM were a partner to us, like some really big things happened, all the stuff you can Google. And uh, all of this was happening, I was like, wow, why is this happening? And then I realized like the difficulty and complexity of neuroscience was a gate to wealth for people of color in this country. And so that's why I created my fund. We, we made, we, we're in the progress of making a few investments and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to take all of the knowledge and all of the expertise and all of the access that I built up and like find a way to make change in societal level. So that's the capital, that's where I am today. Um, and you can check this out, which is pretty cool as well. We just won, actually, this, again, kind of back to the crap and the barrel privacy, but we just won a competition at MIT a couple of months ago um, with something called Brain Rap. And basically what this is like sports science to rappers. And so I was signed to a record label for a little bit last year and um, while I was doing this stuff, and uh, I was like, when I was signed, people, I, I would perform, I'd be wherever, and people wouldn't know the rest of who I was as a person. And I'd tell them about some of this stuff and they wouldn't believe me. <laughs> I was like, all right, cool. It's like on Google, don't listen to me. And, <laughs> and uh, then they would, they're like, oh, Think a person and you rap. How does that work? It's like it's called being a human being. Yeah. You do all the things. Like, so you know, when I started to realize, I was like, and especially when I was signed, um, my investors, some of my board, like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> who you gave me money? It's like I'm being a human being and running my business. And, and when that was happening, I was like, okay, if this is happening to me, right? What happens and how do uh, serious entrepreneurs and, and rappers get taken? you know, in life here in the US. Does this happen to them? And then I discovered it did. I, you know, I spoke to some friends of mine who were musicians. They were like, yeah, you're one dimension as far as the record label is concerned. Your, your lyrical skill, which they don't even respect what they want to make money from. And you get paid like a 360 deal. And boom, you're done, right? 
And I was like, okay, well, let's one, try and fix that paradigm, and two, let me also combine that with neuroscience. So when you guys uh, get a chance, take a look, it's called Brain Wrap. And basically what it was is an electroencography device um, connected to a Vive headset, and it manifests your thoughts. So yeah, don't listen to me, look at Fast Company. <laughs> so, so we did that, and, um, and we won this thing called the People's Choice Award at MIT, which had never been won by anyone black either. And it was mostly black team, and there was like a lot of white people there, so I had to look very hard. But the reason I'm telling you all this, right? Like, uh, there's a paradigm that I think is, is unique to social media, driven by some people edge rack that Facebook put together, and this was also was responsible for the 2016 election that gave us the unknowable. <laughs> and uh, it's it's hemming people into bubbles, right? And you know, I'm working right now with a research group looking at something called programmatic advertising, and this is basically like what is responsible for what you see in the front. Um, and what I found is that one in five of the shootings on the south side of Chicago are because of programmatic spend by people like running companies in this area. So let me break that down. Like, there's somebody at Ogilvy and Matter or IPG Media. Or even Google or Facebook, well actually Facebook is on their social, so Google. Buying up programmatic segments about Fetty Wap, and there's nothing wrong with Fetty Wap, but what's actually happening is Fetty Wap's being retargeted to some kid on the south side of Chicago who gets up, he's already poor, maybe he's an orphan, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening in his life, and all he's seen is Fetty Wap, all he's seen is drill music, and all his, all his friends are only seeing drill music. You're on the bus, you're only seeing drill music and Fetty Wap. You get to school, you're only seeing drill music and Fetty Wap. Nothing about scholarships, nothing about how to access resources, nothing about any of those things, right? And that's happening because they're easy segments to buy to make money. So, you know, we, we found this and, you know, things like that are the reason that there are some of the inequalities that exist in the world and particularly in the United States, right? I mentioned to you our mission as a company is to empower you through technology. And I do want to reiterate that message. I already talked to you about how great tech jobs are, how they're the most highest paying jobs out of college how they're the jobs with the highest potential to make real impact in the world. The most collaborative jobs, the jobs that offer you the most stability and opportunity, right? But I wanna to talk to you now about representation. I wanna to talk to you about diversity and inclusion in the tech industry because the tech industry needs to do a better job here. And it's gonna take everyone in this room, all of us together, to get there. Take a look at what this slide says. Computer science majors earn 40% more out of college on average than your average college graduate. But only 22% of students who take the advanced placement computer science exam are female. That's a huge gap in terms of gender diversity. Less than 10% of students who take the advanced placement computer science exam are Hispanic. Less than 4% are black. We can do better than that. We will do better than that. And here's what's interesting to me about this. If you, if you go to it, if you take computer science, AP computer science, black and Hispanic students are seven times more likely to major in computer science in college and succeed. Seven times more likely if you actually go for it. So I want you to really think about this and I want to encourage you to pursue this opportunity. It's a big one. So I'm gonna show it to you again. <coughs> Learn to code, study software engineering, study hardware architecture. Go to microsoft.com slash digital skills. Learn as much about it as you can. Go to microsoft.com slash learn. Take the free classes that we're offering. Track the assessments and see if you qualify and are eligible to be certified. Please, I'm asking nicely. <laughs> Thank you so much. You. What is digital marketing? But it's simply, this is marketing on electronic devices. So many of you all uh, who have phones, you get uh, newsletters and different types of updates on your phones of uh, different products. So you might download an app 
Instead of getting that news inside the mail, you simply get it on your phone. And they show you any updates that you need to have on the phone. And it's it's a simple process to download. So you no longer have to get mail and then re-send out the mail to the, uh, the company that sent you the mail. Now you can just get an update on your phone and then you'll be able to update or install the new technology. Moving forward. One type of uh, digital marketing is SEO. So this is one of my favorites. This is what I learned while in college. And uh, this is really where many marketing agencies come into play. So with search engine, search engine optimization, it utilizes keywords. So these words would be uh, from McDonald's. They probably would have, I'm loving it, which is their slogan. Uh, that will come into play here because when you search up, I'm loving it, Instead of uh, I'm loving it.com showing up or like some random website, you would actually get McDonald's to come up first in the server when you search on uh, sites like Google, Bing, and uh, now DuckDuckGo, which is a uh, new site. So another form of uh, digital marketing, which a lot of people are uh, capitalizing on right now, is social media marketing. So uh, social media, as you all are familiar with, is uh, sites like Facebook, Snapchat, uh, Tumblr, Instagram, which is one of the most popular. And the way that uh, social media marketing works is basically companies get to interact with you personally. So on your Instagram accounts, on your Facebook pages, Everywhere online, you show your friends, your family, what you like. You, you like many different things that you like in real life. Uh, many shows that you may like, you might post it on your Instagram account. And what does this do for businesses? This gives them a chance to see a little bit about your personal life. So it's more intimate. So it's less like uh, newspapers where they sent you a newspaper or you went out and bought one. And you really, they really could engage whether their marketing worked. Now with social media marketing, they're able to track the marketing efforts, they're able to track who clicks on it, who sees it, and everything with social media marketing is all about data. So all your data that you put up online on your uh, Instagram pages, people use that. So many companies use that. And psychographics, where they take a, a look at who you are, so your age, your gender, your race, many different things, and they use this so that they can better reach their target market. So if someone had a uh, dating site and it was for like, you know, people who are in their mid twenties, they are now are able to target everyone in their mid twenties and get in touch with them just through social media marketing. So this way you don't have a wide umbrella. And one thing that I learned with marketing is the wide umbrella approach is, I want to say that it's dying right now because you really want to get to your target market. You don't want to have to try to get to everyone because it's usually not effective. If you can get to your target market with a, a simplified approach that gets directly to them, then you can always win over that customer. So next, I want to talk about the one thing that you guys may be really familiar with, which is uh, influencer marketing. So uh, as you can see here, I have uh, many different uh, brands and uh, influencers up here. So hold on, just one second. Yeah. So. Uh, Right here, I wanted to show you guys basically the uh, the opportunities that you have with influencer marketing. So here you see LeBron James, uh, Dwayne, The Rock Johnson, Kylie Jenner, Beyonce, and these are many people who have large followings on social media sites like Snapchat and Instagram. And uh, basically what influencer marketing is simply is, it's the process of paying these uh, entertainers to market your brand or your service online to their followers. So why would, why would a company want to use influencer marketing? <clears throat> Put it simple, you want to get to your target market the best way possible. So if you sell basketball sneakers, who would you want than the probably, arguably the best yes. basketball player right now, LeBron James. So wouldn't you want Le LeBron James to market your basketball sneakers to your target audience? Another way that you can uh, utilize influencer marketing is simply this. If you have a product that you know that many people who would buy that product use this uh, competitor's product, you can get to someone like Kylie Jenner on uh, Instagram and have them market your product. So 
while you might not be able to get to uh, some of these larger influencers because they do have such big companies uh, targeting them with big with uh, bigger budgets, you can get to a, a smaller uh, Instagram uh, influencer who can get you those type of uh, sales that you want to transform from these uh, marketing campaigns. So next, I would like to bring you into the future of digital marketing. So the future of digital marketing is going to be largely impacted by VR and AR. So uh, these new technologies are really game changers because they allow marketing to not just be on your computers, on your phones, but it's, it's now going to be almost like a, in the real world. So I want to start with uh, augmented reality and uh, how this will change digital marketing and how you guys can get in on this. So uh, to begin, many companies like uh, Yelp, uh, Ikea, they utilize augmented reality right now to market their products and services. So. I'm not sure if any of you guys are familiar with uh, Ikea's app, but uh, if you would like to buy furniture, you now can see how that furniture looks in your home before you even purchase it. So why is this so huge? Because now you don't have to buy the product and have it in your home and then return it just to see if you like it or not. Now you can simply put up your, your tablet or your phone and really see that product in your house in real time. Uh, Yelp, Yelp is a big one. So Yelp actually allows you to see the reviews of places on your phone just by putting your phone up. So they have an AR feature, uh, AR feature which is really, is not as popular as their uh, normal reviews, but you could utilize this just so in case you didn't want to go to the Yelp and uh, Yelp app and look at the list. You could just click up your phone's camera and you can see if the place is good or not just by looking around with your phone. Next, I would like to get into the uh, VR. So virtual, re uh, virtual reality is another big, uh, big game changer for digital marketing. And the reason I say that is because it immerses you in a uh, virtual world without you actually leaving the comfort of your home. So if you wanted to go to a, uh, on a roller coaster ride, you can simply use your VR headset to go on that ride. Uh, it just brings you to new worlds and the possibilities are endless. So one of the possibilities that I was thinking about was uh, the com uh, movie commercials. So like the trailer for movie that you see on TV. Uh, what if you could just use a VR headset to see that uh, movie trailer and actually be in that world? So in real time, you would actually see the movie trailer and it would be like you're inside of the movie trailer instead of it just being something that you're watching on YouTube or a TV commercial. So the possibilities are endless, and the reason why I was happy to uh, present this to you all today because many of you all will be uh, graduating high school soon, if not uh, this year, and these markets are relatively new, so they're just opening up. So you guys have a chance to start companies and help out older uh, companies who don't know how to utilize this technology, and you're on an even playing field. So this technology is not really at its peak yet, but you guys can start learning how to utilize AR and VR technology and get it to that next level. So you might have pizza stores inside of your neighborhoods that are they're a little bit outdated. You can utilize these new technologies to allow them to market themselves. So if you think about AR that I was speaking on, AR, what are possibilities that you could use uh, AR with, with like a, a local restaurant? You can pop, uh, possibly help them showcase a new food item to people all over and without them ever having uh, purchased that food item. So just being able to get that a real live product into in front of a uh, customer's face before they actually purchase it is like, it's huge. And a lot of companies are gonna capitalize on this in the future and you guys can create companies and learn how to use that technology so that you can be uh, early entrance in this market and make sure that you make some money with VR and AR digital marketing. So next, I would like to just motivate you guys a little bit more. So why am I here today? I just graduated college. So this is fairly, uh, fairly early. Thank you guys. So this is uh, fairly early for me to be speaking to you all, but if you really think about it, there's no Google way to talk about marketing because it's always changing. So there's no conventional rigid uh, principles in place that uh, can find marketing. Marketing is always changing. When I was younger, 
before technology came about and phones were uh, widely spread, I remember marketing just being commercials and newspaper. So now we have phones, tablets, laptops, and these all are mediums which we see digital marketing on. So with these mediums always having new techniques and strategies for digital marketing, it's always going to be changing. There's many people who get into entrepreneurship who are 17, 16, 18, and they start digital marketing agencies. And what they do is they do the marketing for older brands. So you might know some people that are 50, 60 years old. They don't know how to use technology. They don't know how to use social media. You guys do. So that's where, where you guys come in. And you guys can make agencies partner up with each other and say, hey, let's uh, do marketing for them. Let's uh, take care of their social media accounts. And you guys can make money in the process of doing this and learn more techniques. The great thing about this is that if the techniques are always changing, then that means that you guys can create the new techniques that will be used with digital marketing. So it's a fairly even playing field. New entrants can get into digital marketing and uh, utilize their skills of just technology, social media, to make themselves some money and create companies that help other companies. Next, I would like to get into entrepreneurship in a little bit more depth. So uh, just a lot of companies having like uh, being started by 18 year olds, 17 year olds, just handling social media accounts for businesses. I just wanted to just speak on that a little bit because that's that's like that is that's crazy to think about that. When I was 17 years old, to be able to just manage a social media account for a company and make money from that. That was like literally the last thing that I was thinking about. And now the fact that you guys have such an early age to utilize a skill, which you guys might not see it that way. You might post on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat every day. You guys might not see that as a skill, but learn, learning how to utilize this new technology is, is impactful. And you can use your skills with this technology to make yourself some money in the process. Next, I would like to get into the route that I took, which was uh, education. So uh, I graduated with my degree in marketing, and I would say that there's a lot that you can learn. So marketing is not just uh, what you see uh, with advertising, commercials, uh, digital marketing that we have today, but it uh, also encompasses a lot about uh, psychology and communications and many different other uh, smaller things that go into that umbrella. And the reason I wanted to bring up this, uh, just going to college for marketing is because if, think about this, if you go to a college for marketing and you learn about psychology in a process, you learn about your friends, you learn about yourself, you learn about how people respond to different things, you learn about how to market to someone, and you also learn about how to sell to someone. So that's a possible opportunity that you can uh, grow skills that help you in any sales positions that you may have. Uh, getting that degree helped me in a lot of ways because I always knew that uh, marketers and companies knew how to target their customer psychologically but I never really had a firm grasp on that. So if you really think about it, Apple, an Apple iPhone, how many people in here has an iPhone? By show of hands. <laughs> and can I ask this one question? Uh, anyone can answer this question. Why do you guys have iPhones? <laughs> Anyone else would like to answer? Yes. Would you like to answer the question? Uh, you can say a lot. They're better than Android. They're better than Android. So, everyone who said that they have an iPhone, how many of your friends have iPhones? Everyone. Watch your hand. Just raise your hand. If you have an iPhone, how many do all of your friends have iPhones? So, why did this trend come about? Can anyone answer that? Why did, why did everyone buy iPhones, which came about, I want to say around 2011, 2012. Why did you guys decide to buy iPhones? It was something cool to have, and this is where psychology comes into play. So brands understand that you like things that make you popular. So you guys are in high school, so I've, I've been there before, so I know popularity is a huge thing amongst high schoolers. And just having that iPhone is just like, hey, we're part of this in crowd. So they understand that you guys want to belong to something. They understand that uh, a group of you guys would like to be a part of another group. So the iPhone group came about because it was like a, I want to say a lifestyle brand. 
And this lifestyle brand means that if you have an iPhone, you live a certain type of lifestyle. And they were relatively expensive at the time, so you must have had money as well. So just learning about these different types of things in uh, college really, really helped me understand marketing better. I also would like to say that uh, communications, being able to target yourself and uh, target your uh, direct customer in a better way, is it's, it's impactful because communications, if you don't understand that, then you could risk uh, going about having the wrong type of message sent to the wrong group. So if you're uh, making a site that is for, I want to say like a young uh, black and Hispanic entrepreneurs and you would like them to get funding on that site, if you don't market that, if you don't communicate uh, the right message in your marketing strategy, you can risk getting to the wrong audience and being unsuccessful. So just learning about communications while you're in college is super impactful. Communications, psychology, uh, learning how to uh, use different uh, graphic sites like Adobe, Photoshop, uh, Adobe uh, Illustrator and After Effects. These different types of things allow you to create your own marketing collateral and use that to market yourself. So I would, any, if anyone in this room is interested in marketing, I would say to start learning how to utilize uh, Adobe, Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, Adobe After Effects, Adobe Premiere Pro, and a couple other uh, softwares because if you know how to make your own marketing collateral, it's kind of like, it's, it's, I want to say that marketing is holistic in the sense that if you know how to come up with the marketing strategy and make the collateral, it's just so much more impactful. So if you want to get a job in marketing, if they can hire you and you can say, hey, I can make the strategy for social media and I can also make the original content, it's just an a added bonus for you to become an asset for a company. So uh, that's all for my presentation today. And uh, I definitely would like you guys to really look into marketing as a, for, as a degree in college. And I also would like you guys to look at the opportunities that you have for digital marketing and go to different companies and uh, businesses that are in your local areas and just say, hey, do you guys have uh, social media accounts? Do you guys need help with uh, managing your social media? And see if you can uh, come into play and help them out with managing their Facebook, their Instagram, and also make some money in the process. So uh, that's all for my presentation. My name is Keon Dukes, and uh, thank you all. For